If you're ticked off as a taxpayer over the government's monument to mismanagement, the VA hospital in Aurora, you should have seen Congressman Mike Kaufman go off today. The Republican from Aurora unloaded on the VA like, well, like we've seen his constituents unload on him at town halls. I just don't know how you could not have answers to these questions and, ha and, and, and be in the position that you're in. You've either not answered or evaded a number of questions today that are very basic to, to this particular construction uh, project. I'm just sh stunned at, at your lack of knowledge uh, on, this, on this project, that anything that, that occurred the day before you got there, somehow you don't know. I would, would ask uh, Dr. Shulkin and, and ask the president uh, to clean house, and that's what he should have done from day one, and it hasn't been done. What had the congressman so riled up isn't that the VA hospital is $1 billion over budget, or that it'll cost another $300 million to fill the hospital with equipment, or that it's opening years later than expected. As he told our Marshal Zellinger, what has him so ticked is the fact that the new hospital is bigger, yet somehow smaller. The new VA hospital will open in August. <laughs> Yay! But we just found out the old hospital near 9th in Colorado will stay open for another three to five years. How is it that you're just bringing this to, to public light now? I, I thought we've been transparent on the uh, issue of the challenges with uh, the PAC team capacity at the new facility. I'll, I'll have to look into that, sir, if, if, if we haven't been transparent. Ralph Galati, the director of the VA's Rocky Mountain Network, took a lot of heat from Congressman Mike Kaufman, who accused him of knowing for years that the VA intended to keep the old hospital open once the new one was ready. What they tend to do is they tend to hold information that they know up until the last minute that they have to disclose it, uh, because they think that that mitigates their public relations disaster. The congressman spoke with me from D.C. after we found out the old hospital is needed because it has 60 primary care exam rooms. The shiny new campus, 34. It's beautiful looking, uh, but, but it's, but it's uh, inefficient. The VA uses something called patient-aligned care teams, PAC teams, as part of primary care for veterans. The old building has room for 20 of these teams. The new building... 12. That means some of the PAC teams will stay in the old hospital. As time evolved, um, the, the patient-aligned care teams came into existence. They take up more space than the regular clinics do, and that has resulted in Well, that, that's still a not an explanation. I mean, the fact is that, that you have X number of primary care personnel, no matter how they're arranged. Explain to anybody living in Colorado or just a taxpayer how we should be okay with spending $2 billion on a new home and keeping the old home is offensive to the veterans who have made tremendous sacrifices in defense of this country and is offensive to the taxpayers uh, that, are, that are footing the bill. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. As if staying in the old building isn't insulting enough to taxpayers and veterans, the VA plans to send other overflow services over to Golden or up to Loveland or down to Colorado Springs. Do we mention the new hospital is nearly twice the size as the one in Denver? So I have had guys email me and email this program asking why some women are hesitant to report sexual harassment and are just coming forward now. So perhaps, gentlemen, a real-time example would help us explain. Democratic State Representative Steve Lebsack has just been formally accused in a complaint by a third woman. And if his past history is a guide, Lebsack will now call her a liar, reveal details of her supposed sexual history, and claim that she came on to him first. That's how he's dealt with the past accusers. That may be one reason why some women choose not to speak out. But Cassie Tanner has decided to file a formal complaint with the legislature this week, about the same time that Lebsack, Democrat from Thornton running for state treasurer, sent supporters a link to this video proclaiming his innocence and attacking his accusers. Tanner says that Lebsack unbuttoned the top of her shirt at a political gathering at a bar and said, that's better. The former legislative aide had publicly claimed that this happened in 2014 or 2015, but she had not until now registered her complaint with legislative leaders. Lebsack, for his part, says he did not do it. He claims that he was playing the video game Ms. Pac-Man at the time and got a really high score. He also claims he has a witness, unnamed at this point. He did not respond to our questions today. The campaigns for governor are spinning the fundraising numbers out today. That always happens. But one campaign, one candidate, is disrespecting your intelligence. Jared Polis, I'm looking at you. No one should begrudge the Democratic Congressman from Boulder his personal fortune. He earned it. He's no trust funder. 
but the Polish campaign's sanctimoniousness about not accepting donations over $100 assumes that you, the voters, are dumb. That you don't know that Polis has poured $1.4 million of his own money into the race. That's why he can turn down big donations. I mean, even then candidate Donald Trump was more transparent. He said he wasn't beholden to big interests because he's rich. He didn't need their money. The Polis campaign pretends it's some kind of moral high ground. It's not a high ground. It's just a pile of Jared Polis's money. Desegregation. It seems like a term from some bygone era, but it is a current problem in Denver. The city which long ago tried busing, that didn't work. Now there's open enrollment, that's not working. So a community group of parents and neighbors wants to take a fresh crack at breaking down desegregation from the ground up. Laura Lefkowitz is a former Denver school board member. She is now part of a group called Park Hill Neighbors for Equity in Education. She says that there are too many schools like Stedman Elementary that are nearly all minority while other schools are nearly all white. Lefkowitz wants people to rethink what they're looking for in a community school, hoping to get people to support a model where the student population is more diverse. What could we do to um provide the kind of education in, in our neighborhood schools that would attract different kinds of groups of people. Her group plans to hold a community meeting to talk about the issue of desegregation in, in city schools. They're meeting 10 a.m. Saturday on the 27th at the old Smiley Middle School, which is now McAuliffe International. The first female high school football coach in Colorado is now a coach without a team. Nederland High is dropping its football program. Boulder Valley School says it was too tough for the small school to do both boys soccer and football at the same time. We first met Coach Beth Buglione here on Next last year. She told us that she took immense pride in being the one who led the eight-man Panthers football team, but she told us she was even more proud that Boulder Valley Schools looked past gender and saw a coaching role for a woman who had played women's tackle football. A Boulder Valley spokesman told us today that the Nederland players are welcome to try out for Boulder High's football team next year. Just go down the hill a bit. Whether Coach Buglione has a role is yet to be determined. Our next question comes from a viewer named Jan. Wonder if you know anything about this license plate. Is it something new for Colorado? All right, Jan, let's take a peek. Nope, that is totally not a street legal plate that you saw there on I-70. For the driver's privacy, we have blurred out all of the letters and numbers except the Q. If you watch the show, you know why we had to leave the Q. The Department of Revenue says, no, that is not a street legal plate. That's some decorative plate, European-style thing. It looks to us like the person got their Colorado license plate number on there, even put the registration stickers on it. It is still not a legal replacement for a normal license plate. That person is about to get pulled over. All right, I am ready to give the poor train to the plane a break, but I understand that you people love this segment. So I will ask you, is the A-line working today? And the answer is, well, sorta. There was a mechanical issue near the Central Park Station. There are 20 to 30 minute delays east and west for about two hours this afternoon. Funny enough, we were actually talking to RTD today to see if there were any A-line updates that they want to let us know about. They said, oh, nothing to report other than a little humble brag about on-time performance in 2017 being at 95%. As above their goal. As for the G line, line out to Wheat Ridge in Arvada. Testing is continuing there. No big surprises or updates. They're going to continue through the formal certification process with regulators. We'll keep you updated. Libraries, not so quiet anymore. One loudly proclaims it's done with fines, while another fights politicians over concerns of censorship. Organizers look to reclaim the political passion of last year's Women's March, as RTD hopes not to repeat what the president might call a sh show. Next. Clear and cool in downtown Denver tonight after a day with highs above average again in the low 50s. I'm meteorologist Kathy Sabin. Tracking a storm for the weekend, but before that storm gets here, winds out of the southwest will push temperatures into the 60s in record territory Thursday and Friday, ahead of a storm that could bring up to three inches of snow Saturday night into Sunday morning. Beneficial snow for the resorts. No winter weather or travel advisories posted yet, but it is a mess off to the west, and all that moisture is headed our way. Other than high clouds tonight and tomorrow,
tomorrow. A little bit of wind in the foothills. Beautiful weather pattern shaping up until Friday. Uh, some of the models suggest close to 70 on Friday ahead of that storm that could bring the snow. Clear, cool, and 24 tonight. Sun setting again, as you know, about 5 o'clock. 62 degrees would be about 20 degrees above average tomorrow. A trend that continues until the weekend. Chance for snow Saturday ending midday Sunday. Sunday's high only 34 degrees. Temperatures moderate somewhat on Monday. And up in the high country, they call it the, cow the cowboy downhill, but the cowgirls have it. This picture in tonight from Shannon Lukens out of Steamboat, Kyle. Kathy, thanks. So if you were surprised by the 150,000 people at the Women's March in Denver last year, you weren't nearly as surprised as RTD. So as organizers plan for Saturday's march, RTD is stacking up extra light rail cars and more buses. Buses that will be packed, if last year is our guide, by people in pink. So this is where everyone was meeting. Even people that waited forever were really patient and good about it. The biggest thing that the march did last year was uh, really excite people and empower them. My body, my choice! People could say this is what America is to us. Look at this group of people. This is like our country. I'm Lisa Cutter and I'm an organizer with March on Colorado. I'm Jessica Rogers and I am a organizer of the Women's March on Denver. I think moving forward it's going to be a, con a continued coming back together and saying, okay, we just did work for a year, now let's come back together, what else needs to be done? <laughs> There's been a lot of things that have gone on this last year. Lots of women stepping up, lots of women stepping up. We want to help people eventually understand that there are things they can do and that there are things that, ways that they can uh, help create change in their own communities. We have had some wins at the end of this last year. Um, and we need to keep pushing towards it because we have noticed it does make a difference. Marching just demonstrates that solidarity. It sends a, a voice, a, you know, sends a big signal to people that are in power uh, that we are, we do care. We're not going away. We're going to keep on it. Like this whole area was filled with people. I almost think it should be an annual thing. I think for now, it's a reminder that there's work to be done. We're ready. We're ready. Yeah. Bring it. <laughs> and I think eventually it should be a celebration. <laughs> One of the goals of that march last year was to get more women to run for political office, which brings us to the fact that we need to disclose Lisa Cutter, who you heard from there, is also a Democratic candidate for State House District 25 in Jeffco. Leaders in Elbert County face a lawsuit over censorship concerns. Go back to the library. They're ready to forgive you for that book you still have. And toilet paper tells us the total of comings and goings at the airport. Next. The Elbert County Commissioners are getting sued over their plans to reassert control over county appointments. The people who run the county's libraries don't want politicians determining who's in charge of what people read. If politicians were allowed to stack our board of trustees with people who agreed with their viewpoint, then the risk of censorship would be increased dramatically for us. In other words, the county commissioners or even a municipal board would be able to censor the information we would provide. The commissioners blasted back today that the Pines and Plains library system is spending money on an expensive lawsuit rather than just having a meeting with them. Library leaders tell me commissioners brushed off their attempts to talk. Now, this really kind of gets in the weeds, but you like this stuff. So this comes down to state library law and what particular degree of political independence they are given under the law. We'll let you know how this shakes out. So speaking of libraries, it is a sort of scarlet letter in the place where you would usually find copies of the scarlet letter. Libraries, they have been shaking us down for ages on late fees and such. Our resident procrastinator, Steve Steger, found one library in town that's decided they don't want your pocket change. They just want to see you more often. You finding everything okay? Yeah. Perfect. It's that moment of truth, the second you swipe your card before checking out books and wait for the all clear. The fine check. Okay, if you're not a procrastinator, it's not as scary. 
You know, I know I always bring mine back because I feel like, you know, it's if I don't get it back in, in time, somebody else won't get it. No matter which camp you fall in, the reality is you won't have to worry about it anymore at Arapahoe Libraries. They've done away with all overdue book fines. Why would they do that? Good question, Mark. We wondered the same. The reality is fines aren't always friendly, and sometimes they create feelings amongst our community and patrons that involve embarrassment, guilt, shame. The library spokeswoman, Jessica Seidner, also answered our second most pressing question. How on earth do you expect people to bring books back if there aren't any consequences? If that due date approaches and they still have not turned in the item, then they're issued a replacement fee. And she says the library isn't really losing much. She says last year overdue book fines made the library about $139,000. That's less than 1% of our overall operating budget. Libraries around the country are beginning to realize that fines are keeping people away. City library systems in Salt Lake and Columbus, Ohio have already eliminated their fees. We asked Denver today. They said they're exploring the idea. We do not want people who feel guilty, shame, maybe who can't afford the fines and need us to, for that to prevent them from coming in. So follow me here. Yeah. If your book is overdue, you have 30 days to get it back to them. If you don't do it in 30 days, they charge you that replacement fee. But if you bring the book back to them and Aha. you return it to them, they Found waive it. that fee. So no, no. fee at all. Okay. Uh, by the way, they're also instituting an anti-shh policy. No shing? No shing. No shing at all. No, li right. no librarian will shh you there. No. Even if you're That's loud. Right. Even if you're loud. But, you know, if things get a little disruptive, they might say, sure. please be quiet, but no shh. All right. Trying to change the face of the uh, the library as we change the face of our set and sit here on this temporary one. Which this is, is nice, by no, the way. It's not big enough for the two of us. Oh. Please exit that way. Okay. Thank you. TMI from DIA today. We got the 411 on their TP situation, and they go through a ton of toilet paper, just as you might suspect. It's one more measure of how many people come and go at our airport. 400 cases a week, 96 rolls a week. As Chris Delia says, you do the math. 38,000 rolls. Partial rolls that get changed out over the course of a day, they get donated to nonprofits. They're not wasted. You measure that in paper towels, and of course DIA did. They say they go through 400 cases a week. Roll them out straight in a line. That's more than 16,500 miles of paper towels used at the airport each year. If you use the paper towels rather than those blower things, which work 50% of the time, don't worry, the paper is composted. We know there's continued interest in who will become the new voice of the DIA train. Here is the latest. The airport says that their picking panel is submitting scores right now for each of the 60 entries this week. DIA should be announcing the finalists in the coming weeks. If you watch this program, you know we are rooting for Kim Christensen. Once she makes that final public voting, that is when the campaign begins. The most Colorado thing we saw today is somebody who went all out with their car. Next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a, oh man, look at that. That would appear to be a, a small Toyota that is absolutely covered in marijuana leaves. Jody Burke spotted this in Lafayette, tweeted it to us. I am curious, how badly do you want to have to get pulled over every time you go for a drive to decorate your car like that? This person may not like marijuana, they just like interacting with law enforcement. Send us things that make you look twice. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Well, good news for Congressman Jared Polis. A lot of folks who support his campaign for governor watch this program and have written in very angry at me for saying that I'm sick of him talking about how he doesn't take contributions over $100 and then putting in $1.4 million of his own money. Donna Lee Lowen says, not sure what's sanctimonious about him spending his own money on the campaign. Your arrogance is mind-boggling, Kyle. Again. He should put his own money into the campaign, but that allows him to not need everybody else's. That's not the moral high ground. We'll see you next time.